Members, a quorum is present. So at this time, I'd like to ask that our guest chaplain, well, first I'd like to ask our guests in the gallery and all members in the chamber to please stand. This morning's prayer will be offered by our guest chaplain, Assembly Member Danny Gilmore of the 30th District. Assembly Member Gilmore. Good morning, members, and good morning, uh, those in this hollowed chamber. What a privilege it is today for me to be able to offer of this opening prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the precious gift of life for each and every one of us in this wonderful state of California. We further thank you for the great gift of freedom you have given each of us here today and have so generously bestowed upon all who reside in the United States of America. 233 years ago this Saturday in a hall some 3,000 miles away, our nation was officially born. Its founders, each of whom pledged a firm reliance on the protection of your divine providence, affixed their signatures to a Declaration of Independence. For the first time in human history, acknowledged the truth that all men are created equal, that each and every human being on the face of this earth is endowed by you, O Lord, with certain unalienable rights, rights that no man and no government can take away. It is therefore the duty of each one of us, particularly those who are privileged to serve in positions of elected office and public trust, to further the cause of these unalienable rights and timeless truths, which today are but imperfectly realized. To this end, we invoke your blessings, your strength, your wisdom, guidance, and support, and humbly offer our sincere thanks. As we today hear the words that announce the birth of our new nation, we also ask you to confer your blessings, your mercy, and your healing grace upon all those who have defended our freedoms, particularly those brave men and women who have served, suffered the injuries of battle, and who have given their last full measure of devotion to the nation to which we pledge our allegiance. May all who have served in the armed forces of the United States of America, together with their families and loved ones, fully appreciate the magnitude of our thanks for their service and their sacrifice. And may all, and may all, we all be heartened and healed by the infinite power of your mercy and grace to better do your will. For all these things, we offer this day our prayer of thanks. In your name, amen. Thank you, Mr. Gilmer. I believe we have an honor guard available today. I'd like to ask everyone to please remain standing as part of our recognition of the 4th of July, um, our Independence Day. We have the Honor Guard in the rear of chambers to present the colors. We have Staff, Staff Sergeant Beatty, who has had 11 years of service, and he's from San Jose. Sergeant Kilday, with 15 years of service from Rockland. Sergeant Sepulveda, who has six years of service and is representing Los Angeles. And Specialist Pearson, with six years of service from Vacaville. Color Guard, please present colors. Like desk, Mr. Silva, to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
Please retire the colors. You may be seated. We now go to the reading of the previous day's journal. The Assembly Chamber, Wednesday, July 1st, 2009. The Assembly met at 11 a.m. Arnold Loy, Saldana, Speaker Portem of the Assembly, Presiding Chief Clerk E. Dawson Wilson at the desk. Mr. Toriko moves and Mr. Gaines seconds. Reading of the previous day's journal will be dispensed with. Presentation of petitions, there are none. Introduction and reference of bills will be deferred. Reports of committees will be deemed read. Amendments deemed adopted. Messages from the governor, there are none. Messages from the Senate, there are none. We'll move on to motions and resolutions. Mr. Torrico. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning. I request unanimous consent for Assemblymember Blakesy to have guests and photographers on the floor today. Without objection. Uh, Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to allow Assemblymember Gilmore to personally adjourn in memory of an individual today. Clerk will note. Absences for the day will be deemed read and printed in the journal. <laughs> Members, we'll recess the regular session for purpose of convening the third extraordinary session. Regular session is in recess. We, will sub we are now entering our third extraordinary session. Without objection, we will substitute the prayer, pledge, and other opening procedures in the regular session for those in the third extraordinary session. We now go to motions and resolutions in the third extraordinary session. Mr. Torrico. Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to withdraw Assembly Bills 57 through 76 from the desk to take them up without reference to file for the purpose of second reading today and to order them to the third reading file for Friday, July 3rd. These measures all relate to the budget. Clerk will read Assembly Bills 57 through 76 for the second time. Assembly Bill 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, and Assembly Bill 76. Mr. Nielsen, for what purpose? Madam uh, Speaker and ladies and gentlemen of the Assembly, I would ask for a no vote on these. These are moving targets. Uh, I think the institution ought not get in the habit of, of just passing along moving targets. We don't know what the bills are going to be in what form, so I would ask a no vote. So you're asking for a roll call vote rather than unanimous consent on presenting these for third reading? Very well, members. Mr. Torrico uh, is asking for an aye vote on this. Met. Well, he has moved that we suspend the rules, seconded by Mr. Krikorian. Uh, Mr. Nielsen is objecting to that motion, so we will open the roll call for a vote. Uh, it takes uh, a majority of those present. This will require uh, 40 votes. 
Clerk will open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. Mr. Torrico is asking for an aye vote. Mr. Nielsen is asking for a no vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Mr. Torrico is asking for an aye vote. Mr. Nielsen is asking for a no vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 40, noes 24. The objection is overruled. The rules, are rules are suspended. Third reading will stand. I just want to remind members we do have an absence, so 40 is the majority needed. That concludes our business in third extraordinary session. We now recess third extraordinary session. Just one moment. Members, as we're working on, we do have some additional business in third extraordinary session, but as we're working on that, I'd like to direct your attention to the gallery where we have some guests with us today from Ursuline High School in Santa Rosa. Uh, there are students here with their teacher, Mr. Herman. So let's welcome them to our chamber.
Members will continue with business in our third extraordinary session. Ms. Evans is going to present bills beginning with file item four in the third extraordinary session. Clerk will read. Assembly Bill 47 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating this to the Budget Act of 2009. Members, if you'll please direct your attention to Ms. Evans. She's presenting on file item 4, AB 47. Ms. Evans, you may open. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, AB uh, 47 through 56 are vehicles for the fiscal year 09-10 budget. Uh, these bills contain technical language and will be amended to reflect the, the final budget package for fiscal year 09-10. Uh, usually, as a procedural matter, the Democratic caucus will vote aye on these bills and the Republican caucus will stay off. Um, we are first taking up AB 47 and then we will go on to the remainder of the bills through AB 56. I ask for your aye vote. Mr. Nielsen. Madam Speaker, I very simply would request an abstention. We would object to, to this, so again, works in process, so the Republicans would like to be recorded as abstaining if we could do the roll call. Or you could just substitute. So members, rather than take up a roll call vote for every subsequent item presented, we will substitute the roll for this bill for the additional bills. So on that, clerk, please open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. 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 Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes, ayes 45, noes 1, the measure passes. Clerk will read file item 5. Assembly Bill 48 with the, by Assembly Member Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we will substitute the roll, ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 49 by Assembly Member Evans, an act relating to the State Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we will substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 50 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we will substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 51 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 52 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 53 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 54 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 55 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1. Assembly Bill 56 by Assemblymember Evans, an act relating to the Budget Act of 2009. Without objection, we substitute the roll. Ayes 45, noes 1.
Members, we have concluded our business in third extraordinary session. We will now recess third extraordinary session and return to regular session. And on your desks, I believe each of you have a copy of a proclamation from the governor's office declaring the need for a fourth extraordinary session. So we will now go through the process of establishing the fourth extraordinary session. So we recess our regular session for the purpose of convening our fourth extraordinary session. We are now in fourth extraordinary session. Without objection, we will substitute the prayer pledge and other procedures from the regular session for those items in the fourth extraordinary session. Governor Schwarzenegger has issued a proclamation to convene the legislature for a special session relative to the economic crisis. The clerk will read the proclamation from the governor. A proclamation by the governor of the state of California, whereas on this date, pursuant to section 10F of Article 4 of the Constitution of the state of California, I proclaimed a fiscal emergency and whereas on this date, I'm submitting to the legislature proposed legislation to address the fiscal emergency and whereas this extraordinary session having arisen and now existing, it requires that the legislature of the state of California be convened in extraordinary session. Now, therefore, I, Arnold Schwarzenegger, governor of the state of California, by virtue of power and authority vested in me in accordance with section 10F of Article 4 of the Constitution of the state of California, do hereby convene the the legislature of the state of California to meet in extraordinary session at Sacramento, California on the first day of July 2009 at a time to be determined to consider and act upon legislation to address the fiscal emergency proclaimed by me this day. In witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand and caused the great seal of the state of California to be affixed on this first day of July 2009. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Governor of California. Members, we have a bit more business to take care of in the fourth extraordinary session. We go now to Mr. Torico. Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent that the vote and oath of office for Karen Bass on December 1, 2008, in the regular session, be substituted in the fourth extraordinary session. This requires a second. Mr. Krikorian seconds the motion. This requires 40 votes, unless the, we can do this without a roll call vote. Mr. Gaines, any objection to doing this? Mr. Gaines, any objection to doing this on a voice vote? All those in favor of adopting the motion signify by the usual sound of aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Mr. Torico. Madam Speaker, I move that the permanent standing rules of the Assembly for the 2009-2010 regular session be hereby adopted as the rules for the 2009-2010 fourth extraordinary session. Mr. Torico has moved. Mr. Krikorian seconds. We adopt the rules for the fourth extraordinary session. Mr. Gaines, any objection to a voice vote? All those in favor of adopting the rules for the fourth extraordinary session signify by the usual sound of aye. Any objections? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Mr. Torico. Madam Speaker, I move that House Resolution Number 3 in the regular session relative to the payment of members and distribution of weekly histories be deemed adopted in the fourth extraordinary sessions. Mr. Krikorian seconds the motion. Mr. Gaines, voice vote. All those in favor of adopting the resolution or the motion signify by the sound of aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes. H.R. 3 from the current regular session is deemed adopted in the fourth extraordinary session. Members, for this fourth session, there are letters at the desk relative to the leadership of the Democratic and Republican Caucus. They will serve in the capacities to which they were appointed or elected in the 2009-2010 regular session. Mr. Torico, on the non-member uh, officers.
Mr. Torico. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I hereby request unanimous consent to allow the non-member officers from the regular session of 2009-2010 be substituted and uh, sworn in today for the fourth extraordinary session. The motion is seconded by Mr. Krikorian. Mr. Gaines, the voice vote is fine. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Torico signify by the usual sound of aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Our non-member officers from the regular session are substituted for the fourth extraordinary session. Members, that completes our reorganization task for the 2009-2010 Fourth Extraordinary Session. Mr. Torico moves. Uh, Mr. Gaines seconds. The Fourth Extraordinary Session is in recess under call of the Speaker. We now return to our regular session. Members, we have a 4th of July Independence Day celebration or, or ceremony to take part in today on the floor. The members who are participating in that can please return to the chamber, return to your desks. Mr. Cook, I believe you have a resolution to take up today. If you'll give uh, the clerk just a moment, he will read the resolution. Members, if you will please direct your attention to Mr. Cook. He's presenting a resolution today in honor of Independence Day. Clerk will read. House Resolution 19 by Assemblymember Cook relative to the 4th of July. You may open, Mr. Cook. Thank you very much. Members, can I have your attention, please? Members, can I have your attention, please? Members, can I have your attention, please? You know, I, I don't get up very often and I don't speak. And when I do, I try to make it your, worth your time, our time. And the reason I'm here today is to introduce a resolution about the 4th of July. And I want you to kind of go back in history and kind of visualize that you're with the founding fathers of our country on July 2nd, 1776. And you have this document in front of you, a document which some might argue is a little late to be presented since the, the previous year, the actual fighting, if you will, had broken out in Lexington and Concord. People had died. Even before that, you had an incident called the Bast Boston Massacre, where individuals died, one of which many of you in the audience might remember, Crispin Attucks. And if you don't know your trivia, I'm going to remind you afterwards with a test. But a lot of things had been heating up, and these people met in this hall to decide whether they were going to take this final step. Now, a lot of people were hesitant. Right now, let's fast forward to this day. They said, Cook, why are you doing this? You know, we got the budget. You know, this is going to distract from everything that's going on. This will deflect from our biggest crisis that we've got going. Our biggest crisis. 
Yes, it's a huge crisis, but we use words like, you know, we're going we're gonna to be dead or we're going to be killed or everything, all these, the hyperbole that's associated. Jefferson and his colleagues had those real words in the back of their mind. When John Hancock signed that, the first one there, he knew he was going to be the first one that they would, the British would string up a rope and hang him. It was serious business. And Washington, who was the leader of the Continental Army, and some would question what kind of army it was. Yeah, they won a, a couple of battles at Bunker Hill, Breed's Hill. Nathaniel Green and a guy by the name of Benedict Arnold were actually the ones that took Ticonderoga and dragged the, the artillery pieces to Boston for the siege. And they were trying to do something in New York. And ironically enough, a month after the declaration was signed, the whole Continental Army was almost trapped and completely eradicated on Brooklyn Heights in Long Island. But a miracle escape across the East River allowed them to survive. Now, these individuals had a lot of courage to go forth in a new direction. It was radical. And you heard the words of it. Everybody knows about it. Such words as, all men are created equal. And we all know now that we, we don't use that, 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 that term men. We're talking about everybody. That was what was so great about that. There was enough flexibility in there to move forward. And were they all equal? As all of you historians know, perhaps the greatest legacy, the greatest failure was the Declaration of Independence and the following document, the Constitution, did not address the overwhelming issue that lingered to that day, and that was slavery. You know, when I was in college, I always had heartburn with Thomas Jefferson that he never could fix that that they caved. Somebody from my home state, Roger Sherman, the great compromise, you didn't solve the issue. You compromised, we all got together, and, and yet you left a lingering issue where in a number of years, in 1860, 620,000 Americans would die. More than all of the wars combined from one issue that we still deal with. Now, why am I talking about this? It's almost like I'm saying they shouldn't have done it. Because this was a radical step. Was it perfect? No. It was deeply flawed in some of their policy decisions and the way they interpret. But in terms of the rest of the world, these people were way ahead of it. That a king or a prince or a czar or what have you doesn't have complete control over your life. That we are born with certain rights that everyone, everyone, everyone has. And that's everyone in this chamber and everyone they represent. Now, that was the foundation. And that's why this day is so important. You know, in this country, I'm a historian, it bothers me that we forget history, you know? Because you just don't learn the good history. You have to learn the lessons from history. History now is what, firecrackers and hot dogs and hamburgs? At my age, I probably should avoid hot dogs and hamburgs for a variety of reasons. Nathan Fletcher is kind of constantly reminding me of my age in my cholesterol level. I've been in a few battles, combat, and I still get embarrassed when somebody lights off a cherry bomb next to me. I jump, I get embarrassed. I can't help it. I have problems with fireworks. They start fires in my district. They're sold on every street corner and that's another policy issue which we'll address at a later time. But we almost forget why that date was so, so important. The average teenager knows more about race car drivers 
with the Firecracker 400 or whatever it is than they do about Jefferson or Crispin or Benjamin or John Adams. And ironically enough, the people that put together, you know, within a number of years, they were fighting with each other. Jefferson and Adams almost didn't speak to each other for years until finally just before their death. But they came together for the common good of principles and ideas which we cherish and we hold firm. And I think we can take a lesson right now as we're in the middle of a huge crisis, that we can learn that yes, we have a crisis, but this is when you have to suck it up. This is when you have to make the tough decisions. No one is gonna shoot you or hang you if you push the red button or the, the other button or if you debate or what have you. But there are people suffering and there is a crisis. And just as these people in the past showed their courage and signed that document which started our country, I hope that we can take that spirit and use it in this crisis that we have on our hands right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Cook. Mr. DeVore. I'd like to thank my learned colleague, the distinguished retired Colonel of the Marine Corps for his resolution. I think it's important to point out that through the lens of history, many people have confused the compromises of the founding with the principles of the founding. And while it's true that language regarding a condemnation of slavery was struck from the final draft of the Declaration of Independence, it's important to understand that both that document and the subsequent Constitution would not have been possible if people stuck to their guns and if the northern abolitionists insisted on an eradication of slavery, we would not have had a nation. And if we didn't have a nation, arguably the institution of slavery would have lasted considerably longer than it did. And what I find important is if you look at the words of Abraham Lincoln, whose portrait graces this chamber, what you will find in speech after speech, in paper after paper, is a reliance on the principles enunciated in the Declaration of Independence to bolster his views that the institution of slavery should pass. Specifically, Abraham Lincoln drew enormous inspiration and strength from the preamble of the Declaration of Independence with the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And for this reason, governments are instituted among men to secure these rights. So there in that brief, concentrated preamble of the Declaration of Independence, you have a remarkable statement about human liberty and about the proper role of government in securing rights that we all have by being human, rights inherent to our humanity, rights that government cannot grant nor take away. And what I find very important to kind of push back those that would criticize the founding, those who through the, the calm and safe lens of history would criticize the founding fathers for their imperfections, what I find is kind of the final proof of this is a speech that was made in March of 1861 by Alexander Stevens, the incoming vice president of the Confederacy, who in a cornerstone speech down in Alabama, specifically repudiated the Founding Fathers and the Declaration of Independence and what they said as being inherently false, that it was not in fact true that all men are created equal, that clearly that's not the case, and that the Founding Fathers made a mistake directly attacking 
the philosophy of Abraham Lincoln, one of the founding fathers of the Republican Party. So ladies and gentlemen, as you, as you look at the Declaration of Independence, which clearly the, the final draft was complete by July 2nd, it wasn't made public for a couple of days later, I would ask that you would look at the individuals who did lay it all on the line, who did in fact have death warrants issued against them by the King of England, and had things not gone the way they had gone, most of those individuals would have been hung. Ladies and gentlemen, those were in fact the times that try men's souls. And these days, perhaps, we can draw some inspiration from what they accomplished. And again, I just thank the, uh, the distinguished uh, colleague from the Inland Empire and, and Marine Corps veteran for bringing forth this resolution. I recommend an aye vote. Thank you, Mr. DeVore. Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker and members of this august body. It is with pride and honor that I rise in support of H.R. 19 uh, by Cook, uh, commemorating the independence of this country. And as an ancestor of those who were slaves who came over some 140 years prior to the July 4th, 1776 celebration of which we concentrate on, I say that the biggest question before America then is still the question before America and this state today. As you see, we have, as we have debated year in and year out, come across one of the quagmires of this country. That is the conflict between legislation and the courts of law. And sure it was true that the question of slavery was before uh, this country, and it still is in terms of the journey from slavery to freedom, not only for African Americans, but for other minorities. We are a melting pot. But what we did discover in our journey through freedom in this country is that the courts have often been the place to which we have looked to try to solve our problems. And when we said all men were created equal, we certainly as we went through this journey, discovered that there were women and often there were African Americans. And African Americans were the first question, and we went to the courts. In the Dred Scott decision of 1837, we said that African Americans were three-fifths a man. And that was how we attempted in the courts to resolve this problem that all men were created equal, by justifying that those of African descent were not four-fourths or a full man. And of course, as we journeyed not through legislation, but through the courts, we eventually came to the truth there as well. Uh, from 1896 of Plessy versus Ferguson justifying that separate but equal. And then we discovered in the 1954 decision that separate but equal was not separate, was not equal. And then we allowed Negroes during that time to go to school with others. And so I rise today to say that as John Hope Franklin, who is one of America's noted historians, in his book, From Slavery to Freedom, that is the beauty of our Constitution, the beauty of the preamble that says all men are created equal, that should be the core of why we come to work every day, to continue to ensure that all of the individuals in this country, and particularly those in this state, have the opportunity to truly be created equal. The vernacular of the terms back in that day when we said men, we are going to continue to fight that men meet human beings, and that we're going to continue to fight to make sure that we all are truly created equal. And I think that we could have heard that thing played out in the budget when we talked about protecting California's infrastructure and institutions we depend upon. And so today, my colleagues, I rise with pride as one of the ancestors of slavery who is committed to fighting not only for those of my culture, but for those of all cultures to make sure that their journey from slavery to freedom really does happen. So I wish all of us a happy 4th of July. And it again, is with honor and pride to urge a uh, high vote on this uh, resolution. Thank you, Colonel Cook. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Amiano. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. I stand in uh, full support and honor of Colonel Cook's uh, resolution, uh, resolution and, and the man himself. Um, I did spend uh, two years in Vietnam from 1966 to 1968. Uh, I was a school teacher during that time, never saw combat, but uh, recognized uh, the courage that people had in combat and uh, their valiant efforts. 
uh, to protect uh, democracy. Uh, I think the key to what Colonel Cook said was the issue of democracy and the dynamic of, my, of, of democracy is still a work in progress. Uh, last week, uh, Lieutenant Daniel, Daniel Choi, uh, a decorated combat veteran, uh, along with another colleague of his, Captain Anthony Woods, uh, both were discharged because they challenged the don't ask, don't tell policy. Um, on the road to perfection, we will see uh, a, a wrinkle or an obstacle. Uh, the great thing about this country is, and why I cherish it, is because we can address it and eventually resolve it, just as we did with the issue of slavery. Um, it's going to be a proud Fourth of July for all of us. I'm so sorry that we lost the service of these two fine men. Uh, I know there are additional uh, individuals uh, who also uh, have felt this discrimination practice against them. Some of them have died in the service of our country, uh, but are still not fully recognized because of their admitted sexual orientation. Uh, I'm proud of this country. I'm proud to be in the assembly. And I know I will be proud when I can stand up on this floor in the next year or two and, uh, and say that Don't Ask, Don't Tell has been eradicated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amiano. Mr. Silva. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is uh, a great time for uh, all Americans to be able to, to celebrate uh, our birthday. I've had the privilege of spending time back east, uh, Lexington and Concord, and walking the Freedom Trail in, in Boston. And uh, Colonel Cook, you reminded me of the times that I spent back in Boston. But the reason, the actual reason I'm standing uh, here right now is to uh, tell you thank you on behalf of uh, widow of a Marine that just emailed me and she saw this on uh, the Cal Channel and she said, uh, God bless Colonel Cook. So uh, thank you very much. And I think I have the answer to the trivia question that you haven't asked yet. Happy birthday, America. Thank you, Mr. Silva. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Cook, you may close. Well, I don't think there's much more to say. I want to thank my colleagues. And uh, I got a little abrupt at the beginning asking, but I, we do get passionate about this. It's something very, very important. And I appreciate the fine comments, but it's not about me. It's about what these principles stand for. And I ask you to, or to open the first roll for co-authors so that they might join in this resolution. Thank you. Clerk will open the first roll for co-authors. This is for co-authors, members. This is for co-authors. First vote is for co-authors, members. The first roll is for co-authors. Clerk will close the roll. We have 75 co-authors. We can adopt this resolution on a voice vote. All those in favor, signify by th there's a request uh, for a roll call vote. Very well. Clerk will open the roll on the resolution in chief. Clerk, please open the roll. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. I-76, no zero, the resolution is adopted. Members, we have uh, an observance of Independence Day that will now continue with Assembly Members Knight and Ma. So if you will please direct your attention, uh, well, before we get to them. Uh, on Saturday, our nation will mark the 233rd observance of Independence Day. In recognition of the signing of our founding document, Assembly Members Knight and Ma will read excerpts from the Declaration of Independence. So I now ask Assembly Member Knight to please come forward. Yeah, I'll just stand. 
Thank you, members. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is the beginning to the Declaration of Independence. Congress, July 4, 1776. Unanimous Declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former system of government. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Thank you, members, for the recitation. I'd like to ask everyone now to please observe a moment of silence in memory and to express our profound appreci appreciation for the soldiers, citizens, and allies who have sacrificed their lives in defense of our nation and for people around the world in an effort to secure the liberty and freedoms we honor today. Please join me in a moment of silence.
I'd like to thank the members of the National Guard who, per who performed our color guard ceremony today and all of the participants of the floor ceremony. That concludes our ceremony. We move on to our regular order of business. We'll go on to our second reading. Clerk will read. Senate Bill 285, 318, 669, 791, 520 with amendments, 790 with amendments, 340 with amendments, 188 with amendments, 209 with amendments, 220 with amendments, 783 with amendments, 668, 131, 192, 359, 693, and Senate Bill 254. Items for concurrence will be continued, reconsideration continued, assembly third reading continued, Senate third reading continued. We move on to the consent calendar. Clerk will read. Does anyone wish to remove an item from the consent calendar? Seeing and hearing none. Clerk will read. Senate concurrent resolution 24 by Senator Ashburn relative to Valley Fever Awareness Month. Clerk will open the roll on the consent calendar. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote who desire to vote. All members vote. This is consent calendar. All members vote who desire to vote. Clerk will close the roll, tally the votes. Ayes 73, no 0. Senate concurrent resolution 43. I-73, no zero. Consent calendar is adopted. This concludes our business on the daily file. All other items remaining will be passed and retained. Members, our schedule is as follows. Friday, July 3rd, floor session upon call of speaker. We will also observe Independence Day. Saturday, July 4th, floor session upon call of speaker. Sunday, July 5th, floor session upon call of speaker. Monday, July 6th, floor session upon call of speaker. Members, we did have one request for an adjourn in memory this morning. Mr. Gilmore has requested that we uh, adjourn in memory. Mr. Gilmore, you may open. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, uh, may I also ask for your attention this morning because another fine young American soldier has given his uh, life uh, in the freedom of, of others. Today it is my humble honor to adjourn in the memory of a young soldier from my district. Army, Army Sergeant Joshua W. Soto, who was a 2002 Avenal High School graduate, died in the line of duty in Iraq on June 16, 2009, with an explosive device detonated near his vehicle. Joshua Soto was only 25 years old and leaves behind his wife, Thelma Soto, his nine-month-old baby boy, Jaden, his brother, Shane Soto, who is currently serving in the United States Air Force, and his grandmother, Julia Soto. Sergeant Soto joined the Army in November of 2002 and was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 77th Armored Regiment, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 1st Armored Division. Sergeant Soto took part in joint missions with Iraqi soldiers from a base in Tamal, about 180 miles southwest of Baghdad. His job was instructing them how to conduct safe military operations. Sergeant Soto was recently deployed from Fort Bliss, Texas on his third tour third tour in I Iraq in April. It was harder to leave for this particular tour after the birth of his son because he didn't want to miss a moment of his son's life. Josh Soto was long remembered for his competitive spirit, his focus, and his big smile. After the tragic death of his mother, Josh and his brother Shane went to live with a loving family and friends who helped raise them. His high school years were spent playing basketball and football and, and games with his many friends. Joss had an intense competitive streak which enabled him to excel in life. He was a Boy Scout and a good shot at the shooting range. Some of the boys that Josh and his brother Shane grew up with chose to become soldiers while far too many young men in the same neighborhood became gang members. According to a neighbor of Josh's whole community looked, to looked up to him with pride because he had grown up to make something of his life. Sergeant Soto earned a numerous service medals during his service, including a Purple Heart 
He was posthumously awarded the Bronze Star, Purple Heart, and Campaign Medal, which rested on each side of his casket. After a military color guard fired three volleys and his young widow and his grandmother were presented the United States flags, Sergeant Soto was laid to rest June the 27th at the Hill of Valor, where veterans of foreign wars were buried at Hillcrest Memorial Park. Our personal and collective freedoms have once again been purchased by one of our kids who grew up to become a patriot of the highest order. Please pause with me now in a moment of silence to reflect on the ultimate sacrifice given by yet another um, young American hero, Sergeant Joshua Soto. Mr. Gilmore has requested a moment of silence. Members, before we move on to adjournment, we have a request from Mr. Calderon. He is asked to speak on condition of the file. Mr. Calderon, uh, members, if you could please take your seats. Before, uh, before you begin, Mr. Calderon, I do need to uh, accept a motion to adjourn. So if Mr. Kikorian will move, Mr. Davis will second that motion. Uh, before I call for the question to adjourn, you may now speak on condition of the file. Yes, Madam Speaker, I, I simply wanted to um, refer back to the governor's proclamation calling yet another special session um, because I don't agree with the statements that are included in his proclamation. And specifically, he proclaims that California planned to borrow up to six billion through re reimbursement warrants, commonly referred to as RAS, to address the budget deficit, to address part of the budget deficit. But this short-term borrowing is no longer an available option due to the recent decision of the federal government not to provide financial assistance or loan guarantees for his emergency short-term borrowing. I don't believe that is true. 
I believe that the governor specifically withdrew the controller's authority to issue uh, RAS. And so I, I, I think it's inaccurate for him to say that, um, that it was because of the federal government. And then moreover, um, he proclaims further, whereas on June 30, 2009, the legislature failed to take action to pass a revised budget for fiscal years 8, 9, and 9, 10 to effectively address the unprecedented statewide fiscal crisis, thereby requiring billions of dollars in additional solutions. Well, I don't believe that that's an accurate statement simply because this House sent him a proposal to cut $7 billion, or, or well, $7 billion in cuts and savings, which would have avoided um, uh, adding $3 billion to our problem. We sent it over to the Senate. Every senator went up on it. And it was widely reported in the press that it was the governor who asked a Republican uh, in the Senate to withhold votes on that measure. And so I, I don't think that these are, are accurate statements, and I don't wish that uh, anyone, the press or anyone else, to assume that we agree with the statements that are included in this proclamation. And uh, moreover, I think that um, I, I don't see the need for a fourth special session, and I will not do it now, but um, I will uh, make a motion next week to adjourn this fourth extraordinary session, because I think it's unnecessary. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. I was distracted, and I apologize for not uh, mentioning about the reading during that discussion, but thank you for your comments. Before we adjourn, I understand we do have another item of business. Just a moment, please. Mr. Kukoran, you'll need to uh, withdraw your motion to adjourn before we can take this up. Uh, we have another motion to take up. With consent of the Senate. And, uh, Mr. Davis, with your consent, may we withdraw the motion to adjourn So, for purposes of taking up a matter of business? Uh, Mr. Krikorian? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, I request unanimous consent to re-refer Senate Bill 43 by Senator Alquist from the Business and Professions Committee to the Rules Committee and Senate Bill 602 by Senator Padilla from the Governmental Organization Committee to the Rules Committee. Without objection. Seeing no further business before this House, now a motion to adjourn is once again in order. Uh, Mr. Torico moves, Mr. Kikorian seconds that the House stand adjourned. All those in favor signify by aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. Quorum call is lifted. We are adjourned. Uh, quorum call, uh, I'm sorry, um, caucus meeting, Democratic caucus in the members' lounge. Democratic caucus.